morning to everyone. Welcome back. It's nice to see that uh, we had a wonderful summer this year. Time to start back up the engine that is the Kenai Peninsula Borough School District. Those of you who've been around for a while remember that I use that analogy of, of, a, of an engine with the district and, and this year I'd like to extend that out a little bit and instead refer to it as a family. I believe that given that we are all in our own capacities pursuing the same goal, that being to continue to be the flagship district in the state of Alaska and continue the pursuit of what's best for kids. I want to make certain that everyone understands that we're all in that same in that same mode and we're all trying for the same goal. We each have our own perspective, of course, and sometimes we may disagree with our perspectives, but we all need to remember that we're hitched to the same horse. This year is going to be a challenging year in ways that I don't know that we even know for certain yet. We know that there are some issues. Funding is always going to be an issue and probably will get to be a really serious issue this year. We have some other things on the plate that we may have to deal with as we go along. It is the goal of the board, I can tell you, to try and keep that controversy out of our buildings as much as we possibly can. The, uh, the, the process this year of establishing board goals came, with go came up with a goal of trying to connect more with our buildings, specifically with board members. So you may see more board members around your buildings this year. I want to make it clear to everyone that when that happens, that's not because somebody's checking up on you, but simply that somebody is checking in. Simply to try and establish that contact, which from time to time we feel gets lost, and I'm sure you feel the same. So, I guess all I can say at this moment is good luck with your year. Hopefully, it will be a productive and a solid year as the past years have been. And uh, I want to I want to encourage everyone to remember that. The goal is to be the finest district we can be, and we'll all pursue that goal. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Dusick, and I am the superintendent of schools here at the Kenai Peninsula Broad School District. And I wanted to take some time to welcome everyone back. And if you know me at all, you know that I'm a a big quote person uh, and this quote that I've got on the screen right now is just something that um, due to circumstances this year is pretty much where I'm going to be focused and uh, you know it's something that I'm gonna be thinking about probably every day as you can see we're trying something also just a little bit different this year in terms of format we're, we're recording the messages this year uh, that was due to uh, feedback from the staff. Uh, this last spring there was a survey put out and over 60% of respondents said that they'd like to try something different so that we could stay at the schools and have some more time to work together and uh, use the technology that we have available so that we can save on travel and, and some of those things. But uh, we are planning on getting some more feedback and we'll see what happens uh, for next year. I always like to start off talking about our students and what I have on uh, the screen now is just really a taste of some of our students accomplishments. Uh, you know every day I, th I believe that our students are learning. Uh, what that really means is that our students are growing and that's really what the state of Alaska needs is our students to grow. We hear a lot of negatives. This is just a taste of the positives of happening in our schools every day. Congratulations to all the students in the schools that were involved in these. And I am looking forward to many, many more and sharing that with all of our communities. Along with that, our staff celebrations. Again, another list of, of things that we've talked about over the past year. Um, I'm really excited about the things that were accomplished. 
Uh, kudos go out to everybody that, that's listed here. And I know this, again, is just a taste of what happens every day in our schools. Uh, just some of the things that we've been recognized for really speak to our leadership around the state and also speak to the accomplishments and the professionalism of our staffs. Uh, very, very proud of this district, and I look forward again to being able to share all of the excellence that we see every day this year. And as we start to talk a little bit about instructional things, I, wa I wanted to refer to this Einstein quote. And uh, what's important here to recognize is that there's no emphasis on a test score here. It's all about our students becoming lifelong learners. That to me is the most important aspect of public education, helping our kids understand the importance of learning, being able to apply what they learn into their real life every single day. That is what this quote really gets at. With that, we obviously have goals and activities that we're going to be focused on this year. From the Board of Education perspective, they have three goals. Funding, which we'll continue to work with the borough and legislature. We'll talk more about that later on in this presentation. Connecting, which is specifically getting into the schools, listening, and talking with the staff, particularly as it pertains to our long-term strategic plan. This year, uh, it's up for review, and we're looking forward to shaping the next several years through the input that we receive from all of our stakeholders, particularly our staff. And then the final goal for the Board of Education is con continuing to communicate. That is, we believe there needs to be more work on a shared value for public education, not only in our community, but across the state. So these are very important activities that our Board of Education will be following up on, and you'll see lots of district administration involved with every step of this. As far as the district goes, uh, we are very, very focused on life-ready skills. The buzzwords are career and college ready, but for me, it is our graduation rate and are our diplomas meaningful? We really want to make sure that when students leave our system, they are prepared to be successful for their future. You've heard me say that many times. And, and what that really boils down to, are they ready for life? Can they take what they've learned and put it into practice so that they can be successful and productive in life? We've always focused on basics of differentiation and personalization. Blended learning is a concept. It's not just technology. Technology is the tool that helps drive differentiation and personalization. That is engaging students with relevance. And of course, I've always talked about relationships. That's the building block to educating anyone. Do you know them? And are you actually caring about them? The other projects that we're working on is within professional development. We are very, very um, focused on improving instruction and leadership. We, we are experiencing turnover as we do every single year. We do have 53 new teachers to the district this year, and we have uh, five different administrators that are new, and we plan on helping them become a part of our family. Yes, I am a big Star Wars fan, and I chose this one because, really, I choose to focus on the positive. I do confront negatives, but in the end, I'm always determined to move forward in what is in the best interests of our students. And I really, really like Qui-Gon Jinn. We always have points of emphasis, and this is the focus, and this is what I hope our real reality is. We focus on the three R's, which is rigor, relevance, and relationships. I've talked about this before, and I'll say it again and again. We need to love the kids. You've heard me also talk about how um, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's all a part, the, a part of the relationships. Relevance is a critical factor, though, in helping students learn. And, of course, we always have high expectations and challenge our students in their learning, which is all about the rigor. We continue to focus on collaboration. And when you work with teams, uh, we're looking at what can we do to help the kids that are struggling? What's the data say? How can we make changes in our approach to differentiation? 
And then also, what do we do to engage the students that maybe already have, know it or have learned the concept? How do we enrich what their offering is? And then I'd like to be able to have our staff get into each other's classrooms and offer feedback on what they're seeing uh, in the collaborative effort that we're, that we're putting forth. Ultimately, uh, we want to make sure that we're providing all of our students a quality educational experience, and I believe we can do that through collaborative practices. And finally, you know, we, we always continue to strive for excellence. You know, last year I talked a little bit about Vince Lombardi. You know, we, we, we try to, we know perfection's not attainable, but we go for it because we know we're going to catch excellence in the process. Our profession makes all other professions possible. Uh, we should be proud of that. We should be proud of being teachers and educators. It's a great profession, very honorable. Let's speak highly of it and be proud of what we do and the difference that we make. Because ultimately, all of our students deserve that high quality educational experience and part of it is our attitude and how we convey it. In a minute here, I'm gonna be talking about some of the challenges that, that we're going to be approaching uh, and so I'm relying on Lincoln to help guide us. You know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm going to work very, very hard to help create the future. And from my level, it's at a state perspective and a district perspective. But I'm only doing what I've always done, even with students, and that is to help create their future and to push them forward and give them the best possible experience. So let's just jump into some of the, our challenges here. First one. You're going to hear it constantly. This is something that the governor's budget office and the legislative financial people all agree upon. This is the most serious financial crisis this state has ever seen. So what does that mean for us? That means that there's going to be a lot of discussion about cost per student. There's going to be a lot of discussion about life readiness and results. And we have choices here. We can either get defensive about it or we can provide the evidence that we do an excellent job and that we are a worthwhile investment. Public education is the number one expense in the state government, as it should be. We should be the priority. And I know that it gets tiresome to continue to defend ourselves. But we have an easy case to make, and it's our students. It's what they do. It's how they contribute to the community. Many of you are products of the Kenai Peninsula Borough School District. You should be proud of that. And I am going to carry the torch with defending public education across this state and within this district. I need your help. I need to know the stories at the classroom level of where kids are showing that they're getting better and growing every single day. There's going to be some accountability challenges. We talk about um, Every Student Succeeds Act and all the things that are coming with that. Lots of unknowns and lots of uncertainties. Please follow along with that conversation. We have an opportunity to build a system that is geared toward the local level. I look forward to contributing to that and I want to hear your voice so that we can build the system in this state that works for our students. Assessment is another challenge that's coming up because we really don't know what the statewide assessment's going to be yet. There's lots of discussion, lots of options, and um, I'm confident that the commissioner will put together a very good plan and we will have things in place well in advance so that we can get good data to help students learn. I want to point out that how we respond to all these challenges are going to be watched very carefully not necessarily by other adults, but by the kids. You know, these are adult issues for the most part, and our job is to focus on providing the best possible education that we can for the kids in the classroom. But they're going to run into challenges in their lifetime as well. And how we respond today will help shape how our kids will respond to their challenges in their future. So let's set a great example and move forward together. Well, welcome to the 2016-2017 school year. Think about two to four reasons why 
when you chose to apply for your position in the district, whether it was two years ago, this year, or you know, 30 years ago, why, why was it that you chose to come to the Kenai Peninsula Borough School District to teach? I asked the same question last week uh, and uh, got some very interesting and inspiring responses. And I'll be sharing those with you at the end of my presentation here today. Well, this is our district. Um, as we all know, it's wide, it's vast, uh, and the really neat thing about our school district and our, uh, where we live and where we work is that no two communities are the same. Uh, we are truly a diverse district. Each of our schools, each of our communities are uh, different. Um, there are similarities, but um, no two of our schools are, are like a, a cookie cutter school. A little look at our personnel uh, district-wide. Um, we have 15 district office administrators, 43 building principals and or assistant principals, 642 certified staff in our district, 493 um, support staff for just under 1,200 employees uh, in our school district, not including substitute teachers uh, and coaches. One of the great things about uh, what we've been able to accomplish uh, over the years, uh, and, and the school board has made this uh, a priority, are our class sizes. When you compare our class sizes to uh, the five large districts in the state, um, and even nationally, um, school districts nationally, we have very, very ideal class sizes in terms of uh, how many students uh, each teacher has in front of them. Um, our elementary class sizes are just under 23. Middle school teachers on average have 20 students in their classes and our high school students have about 19 students in their classes. When we look at all teachers that are employed in the Kenai Peninsula Borough School District for the 2016-17 school years, uh, you can see that uh, we have 47 uh, teachers who have no experience here in the district. Uh, 154 of our teachers have between one and three years of experience. The vast majority of our teaching force are right between four years and ten years here in KPBSD. Uh, we've got 79 teachers that have been here uh, between 11 and 15 years, and 136 of our teachers have been here over 16 years teaching in the school district. Of our new teachers, or our new certified staff, 20 of the 50 had no teaching experience uh, whatsoever. Um, nine of them had one to three years of teaching experience. The vast majority of our new folks um, have between four and ten years of teaching experience. We had one uh, with 11 to 15 years and we had five of our brand new hires with uh, 16 or more years of, of teaching experience. <music> when it comes to student performance. We lead the state in this regard. We are very proud of the accomplishments that our, that our students are able to, uh, to show us from year to year. In terms of elementary performance on the Ames Spring Reading Fluency Tests for grades one through five, you can see from this slide that 76% uh, of our students scored either average or well above average when compared to their peers uh, nationally. Uh, and Ames is a nationally normed test. In the area of mathematics and at the elementary grades three through five, again with the spring administration of the concepts, math concepts and applications test, uh, we had 78 percent of our students uh, scored at average or above average when compared to their peers nationally. Switching to the secondary level, um, when we talk about college, career and life readiness, uh, and earlier today you heard from Superintendent Dusick. Um, talked a little bit about college career and, and life ready uh, and what our, our diploma here uh, in KPBSD means when our students graduate. Uh, we're very proud of our graduation rate. Um, when we look at students that we call career and technical education concentrators, and those are students who take four or more career and tech ed classes in a certain pathway, uh, we have a 94% graduation rate for those students. 
when we look at our district overall, um, both CTE concentrators and, and maybe students who have only taken one or two career and tech ed class, uh, our overall district graduation rate is, is roughly 81%. Uh, and again, compared to, to the rest of the state of Alaska, that, that, that's a very impressive graduation rate. 258 of our high school students uh, last year took 460 college courses at Kenai Peninsula College through the Jump Start program. Uh, and 239 of our students, uh, in addition to that, earned college credit through our uh, college tech prep agreement with the University of Alaska and Kenai Peninsula College. So you can see um, our graduates, our, our high school students who are graduating um, are already jumping into college courses. I'm here today with Lee Ray, a second grade teacher at Seward Elementary School, and Amanda Adams, uh, one of our teachers in our distance learning program. Ladies, thank you so much for taking some time and joining me here to talk about blended learning. Certainly. Yeah, likewise. What I'd like to focus on with the two of you is the blended learning initiative and hopefully tap some of the, I, the, the passion that each of you has for what you're doing with instruction uh, and illustrate that for teachers district-wide. Well, I know that the uh, primary elementary, you know, pre-K, kindergarten, first and second grade elementary teachers that are watching us right now out there are, are just waiting to, to see an example or two of, of what you did last year with your students. And, and I know at the uh, Leadership Academy last May, uh, and then again this afternoon at the uh, Regional In-Service, you'll be presenting district-wide to elementary teachers about what you've done. So um, I'm going to, if you have one or two things that you'd like to share real quick with uh, folks in terms of how you, how you did blended learning at, with your second graders, uh, I'll give you that opportunity right now. Absolutely. I think the biggest thing was, in my head, redefining my role as the teacher and um, also redefining in my own head what the freedom that the kids could have. And so I I had to rethink all of that and then put it into action with the same lessons that I've always used, but with the children sort of having a little more control and me by their side instead of in front of them. The idea was that I created a map and student checklists and then the students would use that to go through the different centers um, to hit the different tasks that they needed to hit to, to learn whatever they were learning. Sometimes it was solo learning, sometimes often, more often it was collaborative with the kids at the table. How did you use Canvas with your second grade classroom? First of all, from the QM course that I took, I learned that I needed to have a good flow. And so for every module, and last year when I did it, the modules were based on the materials the district provided, like the Journeys program for English language arts, and I would go unit by unit. And in the math program, same thing. This year, this summer, I worked a little bit more on making my um, module standards-based, which I'm really excited about because what will happen is a student will go into the, the module that they're doing, and they will have uh, a an eye-catching video, something that kind of draws them in, something that gets them excited about it, maybe, maybe some pictures. Um, and then I I will give them an opportunity, like believe it or not, I have them do discussion, discussion threads. And they are able to comment in there. For example, um, one of the ones I created that will start this fall is the standard is capitalizing the names of products, and so the students get to make up a candy bar, and then in the discussion group, they'll have to write out their sentence and make sure that they capitalize the name of their candy bar. So then they'll move through the discussion group, and they might have um, a little quiz. That's one of the things that I tried to set up in every module was uh, a two-question quiz that would allow them to see where they were at with the knowing, and it would allow me to see. And you can set Canvas so that they can't go forward if they don't get the quiz right. And sometimes I connected it to to Google Documents or Google Draw, different things, you know, 
assign them some activities that they could actually do online. They get to do that piece of it by themselves on the computer while I'm off at the stations with the other kids helping them with their activities. So it was an excellent way to put in that direct instruction that then they would go out and practice on the stations. Well, a big part of our blended learning initiative has been a Canvas and Canvas as our learning management system, um, as I stated earlier, replaced Moodle. Uh, Moodle really wasn't used um, much throughout the district other than by our distance department and our, dis our distance teachers and, and their instruction with students. Um, but Canvas is the type of learning management system that we're finding that is extremely easy to use. It's very intuitive uh, and um, we're very thrilled with with what's happened with Canvas here in the district in, in just one short year. In terms of the Canvas rollout and, and implementation that started last year, um, we were committed to providing as much professional development uh, to teachers as we possibly could. So Michelle Thomason in our professional development department created a Canvas how-to course that helped teachers step-by-step -step learn how to, to kind of get their toes wet in using Canvas. Uh, all the teachers that were a part of our first year digital te technology initiative cohort and last year's cohort were provided some professional development in, in using Canvas. All of our distance learning teachers had to convert their Moodle classes into Canvas classes. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the entire staff at Seward High School who had been using either WordPress Google Classrooms or Moodle as, uh, in terms of their um, management systems um, decided that they were committed to all using Canvas. Uh, and we had many, many teachers throughout the district that uh, were early adopters and innovators of wanting to jump right into to the use of Canvas. Next steps for our um, Canvas rollout include as you have all discovered this year uh, when you came back and you've had to start doing your, your mandated trainings, we've taken all of those mandated trainings and we've put them uh, into bundles and we're using Canvas and, and Catalog as a means of delivering that to you. Um, we hope that more and more of our professional development will be blended with the use of Canvas and we will encourage as much as we can uh, any teacher that wants to learn how to use it, uh, we will give you access to the Canvas learning management system and, and hope that you'll work with some of your peers in, in your schools to, uh, to experiment with it. Here with Amanda Adams now. Uh, as I said earlier, Amanda is one of the teachers in our distance learning program in the district. And um, I also want to share that uh, for this upcoming school year, she will be president-elect of ASTE, which is the Alaska Society for, for Technology and Education. So congratulations. So Amanda, um, just wondering, as a teacher, how did you get hooked up with teaching in, in the distance learning program here in the district? Well, when I first came to the Kenai Peninsula, I was an um, instructional coach and a technology coach for a couple of years. And then that grant position was ending. and. Um, this position came open for the language arts teacher for the distance ed and I love working with tech and I had missed having my own students and so it seemed to be a great fit. How can you make learning engaging when it's online? Well, first of all, I'm never boring. I'm always like animated and so even when I'm recording videos for my students, um, no matter what I'm doing for them, the way that I write, the way that I talk, the way that I act is the same as I do in the classroom. The interaction, the amount of interaction that a distance ed teacher has is not 40 kids, seven periods a day, but it is, you know, two kids on, you know, on Skype, one kid here, one kid there, emailing back and forth, creating videos for them, um, talking on the phone, meeting on links, sharing screens. So it's a different type of interaction, very, very different. Um, but it has a lot of benefits as well. I get to meet one-on-one -on -one with my students at a ratio that a classroom teacher could never even hope for. And I get to meet with all my students like that. 
Um, so my day doesn't look like seven periods with 40 kids in the room, but I still get to meet with them and talk with them regularly. The definition of talk is different, you know, whether it's through email and other, other forms. An uh, example or two that you could share um, over our, our Skype for Business session here that uh, illustrates some of those tips and um, tricks that you, you do to have students engage? Yeah, sure do. Um, one of the things that you brought up was the student and teacher dialogue and what that looks like. And even though my students don't see me in the classroom every day, and that can be challenging for some of them, they see my face all the time. So one of the things that I do regularly is create videos of screencasting that have my face right here I am in the corner. Um, and you can see that I was videoing this summer, and it was a summer school class, so my office was a disaster. Sorry about that. Um, but we, you know, they, they see me, and they hear me, and they sh I'm showing them things all the time. It could be an essay. It could be a project that they're working on with another student. It is that, and they, they see me about 75% of the time, probably. I comment back on their work with audio video commenting, and this is super easy for us to do in Canvas. We literally just click the video button, like right there in their work. If they submit to us on Canvas, we literally just click this, you know, the video button and start talking. All we need is a camera, and if you have a laptop, it's already built in. If you don't, your school librarian does, and you can have one in your office in a few minutes. So, and that's an application that not just distance learning teachers, but teachers with, with kids right there in front of them every day could still use to you know, reach out and provide additional learning opportunities and activities for students. Yep, and then those conferences that you don't have time for when you have seven periods a day with 40 kids in them, you still can have those conferences with them in a very personal way. And they feel like you're right there. Um, and this is an example of the, you know, me commenting and then a student commenting back to me and me commenting back to them. And you can see that there's comments on every single assignment with rubric grading. So that, and that's built in for us in Canvas. That's just part of the drill. So with student to student dialogue, that's one of the other things that you brought up. Um, Here's an example of the discussions. You know, this student posted a discussion post, and then three people responded back to them. And they know the difference between making sure that they explain it and then this, you know, making sure that they just say, I agree. They know that that's different in their grading system. An example of um, shared documents. These students were researching infectious and non-infectious diseases for the health class. And so you can see that they use different colors of uh, um, font to express whose work was what. This is an example of a link that a student did a video in Animoto, and then the students um, commented back to them with feedback on that. You're, you're pretty well plugged in at the state level and nationally. What do you see as the future of the district in regards to blended learning, personalization, you know, and, and nationally? And how do you envision education looking five, ten years from now, and, and what a teacher's role will be in that? Good question, because really I think that as Lee referred to in her part of the interview, that it's really redefining the teacher's role that is kind of the crux of, of the big picture. Um, and, and I say that because we're already doing many of the things that are on that knowledge work graphic. We're already beginning to reorganize how we structure school, whether it's the time in the day, whether they're physically present, whether they're virtually present. We're already beginning this radical personalization um, step, you know, this pathway where students are, you know, create, doing internships and, and getting alternative certifications. All of those things are already in the works. So the idea that um, the work that the students do will continue to go towards that career readiness and that that becomes the norm of what they're going to do with it afterwards, that um, diverse credentials are going to become more and more part of an accepted completion of, um, of high school and the definition of high school changing, the idea of the, the virtual and geographic communities beginning to blend and mesh together of where the kids are taking a class, if they say, oh, 
I want to take that CWOW class over at Kenai Central, and I'm going to take this class from somewhere else. And I think we're already using the sort of data rich. We're already moving in that I, that that vein of the data, and then um, making sure that we have the idea of the digital networking between the content of what the kids are doing and the playlists that really public school kind of becomes they come to us and we create their learning playlist and we teachers are just the facilitators and the providers of the content the guides for the skill I don't think that um, we're going to be responsible for creating a standardized curriculum at some point. I think we, it will all be expected that a kid shows up and creates their playlist. Anything else that you'd like to share with your colleagues, Amanda? I would like to encourage everyone to take stock of what you're doing already and then take stock of, the, of what the blended learning has to offer for you because I don't think that we have to reinvent the wheel. I think that we are, are really being given tools that will streamline our practices and really allow us to build on what we have, not reconstruct. And so I think that um, working together with our colleagues is pretty key. Asking the person next door, how would you do it? And I think that's totally, I think that's great because we all work away with more ideas than of how to implement. And even as a distance ed teacher who works online all the time, I always go to my peers and say, how would you do it if it was you? Okay, where, where we're moving forward in the future uh, with blended learning instruction is we're going to continue to promote the use of uh, our learning management system in Canvas. Uh, we will provide ongoing professional development for any and all staff that wish to to learn how to use Canvas uh, and we're hoping that uh, our initiative on improving personalization will be realized. As a district we have some core instructional models and strategies that that we that we follow that really are the backbone of what we do day in and day out instructionally. Um, and here's a, a listing of those. Um, obviously, Charlotte Danielson's framework for teaching is a, is a big part and has been a big part for many years of um, how we do business here in the district, both uh, with professional development, uh, our teaching model, and also for our um, effective instruction teacher evaluation model. A lot of our professional development has focused on um, Dr. Marzano's instructional strategies. When we talk about collaboration and professional learning communities, uh, we've done, that has been a major focus uh, as long as I've been in the district, uh, and um, the Dufours have had a huge influence on that. Superintendent Dusick repeatedly mentions and consistently mentions the three R's, um, especially the relationship part of that, but uh, rigor, relevance, and relationships are something that we um, focus on day in and day out and, and try to weave that into our professional development, our curriculum implementation, uh, and our assessments. What do we have going on as far as initiatives for this year? Um, many of these are a continuation of uh, initiatives that we've already started, um, but we do have uh, instructional differentiation and personalization as an ongoing initiative for the district. Our digital technology initiative and blended learning initiative will continue to be a major focus of what we do as a district. And we're also moving in the direction of uh, expanding our capabilities and encouraging more and more teachers to experiment and, and share what they're doing across the district with video conferencing. Our digital technology initiative uh, was a three-year grant. We are now entering year three of the grant. Um, and um, this was an initiative back when Governor Parnell was governor, uh, and we applied for a grant in the summer of 2014. We were one of a uh, few districts that were successful, and the Digital Technology Initiative grant over three years has brought over $820,000 to our district uh, to help us leverage um, blended learning and, and digital technology so that uh, we're, we're ready to, to move forward and adapt our 
our teaching and instructing uh, practices for the future. Another grant that we're proud that we were able to attain was the, uh, the Russ grant, or the uh, Learning and Telecommunications grant, which is also known as the Rural Utilities grant. We applied for that in the summer of 2015, and we're a successful um, awardee of that. And that has brought over $350,000 to the district uh, for us to uh, upgrade our digital um, and video conferencing uh, capabilities and equipment. Well, welcome. I'm here with Casey Olson. Uh, Casey is a program analyst from our Information Services Department. Um, thanks for joining me today, Casey, to talk a little bit about uh, video conferencing. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, just to put it out there, I just wanted to say congratulations. I understand that uh, last year you were named by ASTI, the Alaska Society for Technology and Education, as the um, Technology Support Person of the Year, I think is what the uh, yeah. award was. Yeah, that, that, that was a very, very nice uh, award, very big honor, and very, very, very pleased to be nominated and to receive that award. It was really, really cool. Casey, you've been working with video conferencing and Polycom in this district for quite a few years now, and uh, there's no one in the district that knows more about it and has more expertise, uh, particularly on the back end of things, than you do. Um, can you think back to when you first started in the district, uh, what the district was using video conferencing and, and polycom technology for? Yeah, it was, it was like I said, very different. Um, they had probably three or four endpoints, the room systems, and they would connect those through at least bridge from one of the internet service providers and would try to you know, share, share in a conference situation, but I'd hesitate to even really compare them because the video quality, audio quality, connection specific problems that you would have are just so far removed from where we're at today that it's hard to kind of compare them. With, with what happened with the uh, Rural Utilities Grant that we received, uh, the tele telemedicine grant mm -hmm. where we got I want to say 340 some you know right around three hundred forty thousand yeah. dollars what will that allow us to do as a district in terms of uh, being being able to expand our our capabilities with tele, uh, teleconferencing yeah that, that's, a, that's a very good point um, with this with that grant the there was some new doors that were open to us as far as the video conferencing is concerned and I think one of the things that we've tried to keep in mind, and if we can go back to where we were at the beginning, as we went forward, there was always a problem with you know, connectivity, the bridge availability, um, the number of calls that you could support. There was always some limiting factor, cost, network bandwidth. I mean, there's always been a, like a cap or a buffer on those things. And to where we're at today, with the changes that we've made in our infrastructure, you know, just interconnectivity with the schools, and then the equipment that we had available to us to, to use. Um, now with this, this rush grant, we've been able to bring in some new pieces that I think we're trying to remove any barriers or any hurdles to, to video conferencing. So if somebody has this unit or they have that piece of software, or they're at home or they're here, we just want to kind of push all that away so they can just meet and, like you said, have those students or teachers that are in a place where they need to connect to a different you know, group or room, just make that call. Just have that go through. And as far as capacity goes with the, with the rest grant, we've, I think, more than doubled our capacity for, for concurrent calls and all HD calls. And that is a huge um, leap just from where we're at. I don't know, even three years ago. Uh, one thing I want to add too is that that's, it's not just limited to, to stuff in our district. So with some of these different appliances that we've put into our data center, there's those limitations for connecting to people outside of our district are gone too. 
Well, I'm excited and, um, you know, from the district's perspective, we hope that um, this grant that we received will um, be a jump start to more and more teachers utilizing it for, for whatever professional or curricular reason that they need. So uh, yeah. I, I thank you for, for your expertise uh, and, and, and helping out. I know that you were a big part of when we wrote this grant. Um, you were a big part of us getting the grant. So uh, um, thank you. Yeah, no problem. It's exciting times. It's going to be really neat to see where this uh, grant takes us. Nice. Video conferencing grant, or the Russ grant, uh, as I spoke to uh, about earlier, truly helped us be able to um, add uh, additional amounts of uh, video conferencing and polycom equipment so that more and more of our schools had state-of-the-art video conferencing equipment uh, so that teachers uh, in rural schools had the ability to make connections with some of our larger um, urban schools and that their students had op curricular opportunities um, that could be shared from our larger schools to them that uh, those students wouldn't have those opportunities uh, if it weren't for the video conferencing capability. I'd like to have a shout out here for uh, a couple of our teachers who have led this charge and have been pioneers in the area of video conferencing in the district. Uh, Rob Sparks and Greg Zorbis have continually promoted the use of video conferencing uh, not only with what they've done over the years with uh, Classroom Without Walls or CWOW uh, and their global nomads uh, teaching initiatives, um, but uh, every opportunity they get to um, teach their colleagues you know, how to use video conferencing equipment and the capabilities of it, they, they have been leaders in that respect and I would like to uh, thank the both of them for, for being pioneers in that. The focus of the Digital Technology Initiative grant truly was to, as a district, to be able to increase the capacity of each and every teacher to teach in a blended environment. Uh, hallmark of how we're creating that capacity is over three years we've had uh, or will have had 15 teachers annually that are a part of these uh, digital technology cohorts. Uh, who received intensive professional development uh, and lots of opportunities to collaborate with their colleagues in the cohorts uh, to learn about how they can change their teaching strategies and practices uh, into a blended learning environment. We'd like to thank all 40 to 45 of those teachers who have uh, taken on this um, and uh, this willingness to push themselves to, to learn about blended learning uh, and who have become very passionate in this area. So earlier at the beginning of, of my presentation, I, I asked you all to think about why you came to the Kenai Peninsula Borough School District when you did. Um, and I told you that I'd ask that same question to our new teachers. Well, um, we took all the responses from the new teachers and we put that in, in the form of a Wordle. Um, and to end things for you here, I would just like to share with you the Wordle. This afternoon, you're going to learn more about blended learning uh, when you attend one or two of the sessions that are going on. I'd like to thank the following teachers for their willingness to share district-wide what they're doing. I'd like to thank Jen Booz and Wendy Potten, who this afternoon will be talking about all how they've flipped their classrooms and what they're doing with flipped classroom instruction. Greg Zorbis and Rob Sparks will be talking about video conferencing, the direction they hope to see the district move for in terms of video conferencing. Sean Campbell from Homer High School will be sharing about his journey with jumping into and learning about blended learning. For our special education teachers who want to know how this might apply for them, uh, we have a couple of special education teachers who will be presenting, Ray Allen Kurtzendorfer and Rob Ann Stating from Nikolaivsk. Also, Meredith McCullough from Kenai Central High School will be presenting on standards-based grading in the secondary classroom. For those of you elementary teachers who are a little bit nervous about what blending instruction might mean for you, especially in the early elementary grades, Lee Ray from Seward Elementary will be sharing 
all of her cool experiences with what she did last year in terms of blending her second grade classroom. And then Trevin Walker, principal at Seward High, will be presenting on what Seward High has done as an entire building and a cultural shift in that community. And last but not least, another session this afternoon will be the three C's of technology presented by some K Beach teachers. I'd like to thank Jason Daniels, Suzanne Glavin, and Hannah Dolphin for their willingness to, to share what they've been doing over there at K Beach with you. We're very excited about these teacher showcases that will be happening this afternoon uh, and hope that uh, you enjoy um, taking part in those. Remember from last year, I touched a little bit on my background as a farmer. And I picked up a lot of words of wisdom that we shared last year, and, and I want to continue along with that theme just a little bit. And as you know, farming taught me a lot. My grandfather was a huge influence upon my life. This year, I just wanted to focus on about three or four little things that, that I do remember hearing in my days of picking up hay bales. Detail. Pay attention to it. It's going to make all the difference in the world. Paying attention to that detail can save us time, it can save us money, and it also is going to help the students because that smile that you might give in the morning to that one student may change the course of their life. So pay attention to those details. Don't forget, every day that our students come into our schools, they want to be treated fairly. You expect that of me. Does not matter what happened outside the things or the questions that we have to deal with outside of the classroom, when we walk in that door, it's all about the kids. I believe in our teachers, and I'm not just talking about teachers, I'm talking anybody who has been able to work in our system. You're a teacher. Whether you're handing them the tray of food or whether you're going over the equations on the board, you're a teacher for our students. Take advantage of that opportunity to set a great example for them and treat them with respect because you will get what you give. And on that note, I believe very much in this statement. Alone, we can do a little bit, but together, we can do almost anything. And this is, this is the point where we need to come together. I want to say thank you. Make sure that you have an excellent year and we continue to move forward together. I wanted to leave you with a quote from Steve Jobs. And as you read it, I do want to add something that, you know, in order for things to be worth it, you have to choose to make it worth it. What you get is what you give. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the day and you get a lot of things done. Thank you very much.